So far in our video series, we've answered the following questions. What is ISO 17025? Why do we even need standards? Why is ISO 17025 and its policy, procedure, and instruction schema matter? Why is ISO 17025 so important to us in forensic science? Why should the criminal defense community care about ISO 17025? How can ISO 17025 provide a simple method to develop themes to cross-examine experts? How can ISO 17025 be used in, by the criminal law practitioner to help get discovery? We even looked at, can ISO 17025 help us answer the question as to who the actual analyst is? Further, we looked at, how can ISO 17025 help minimize the peculiar problem of fraudulent credentials of a forensic scientist? In this video, we examine how ASCLAB Lab International conflicts with ISO 17025 and honest scientific reporting of uncertainty measurement in forensic science. Section 5.3 entitled Accommodations and Environmental Conditions requires a full documentation into the environmental and other testing accommodations of the laboratory to identify potential sources of error and variance to validate that the analytical devices and the personnel involved in the area where the analytical devices are used are sufficiently free from environmental caused error and yields valid testing results suitable for its intended purposes. Although it's up to the laboratory to establish a policy, a procedure, and instructions to meet section 5.3, these requirements include a full accounting into such heretofore possibly ignored sources of potential error that includes, but is not limited to, biological sterility, dust, electromagnetic disturbances, radiation, humidity, electrical supply, temperature, and sound, and vibration levels. It is also required for the laboratory to monitor, control, and record these environmental conditions that may change within the laboratory and may influence the quality of the results. Perhaps the most fundamental change in the way ISO 17025 laboratories will be conducting their testing and calibration services if they seek to obtain ISO 17025 accreditation comes with the implementation of Section 5.4 entitled test and calibration methods and method validation. Typical forensic science applications and disciplines that involve measurement science include toxicology in the case of blood alcohol content testing, mass determination, drug purity, and distance to muzzle just to name a few. There are also other measuring disciplines that report measurement and therefore fall under the new requirements of ISO 17025. And these include trigger pull, barrel lengths, atomic absorption spectrometry, AAS, and inductively coupled plasma atomic emission spectrometry, analysis of gunshot residue, refractive indexing, microscopic dimensional analysis, and even DNA. It's beyond the scope of this video and this concept to include the contributions of others who have studied and presented uncertainty measurements, such as Ted Voss. Uh, but I've blogged on this before, and I would, I would suggest that you take a look at our blog, and specifically the ones that are entitled Metrology-Based Posts with Respect to the Truth About Forensic Science blog. And there are also ones on the Pennsylvania DUI blog. However, it is within this subsection, namely section 5.4.6, that we find the encapsulation of the need to report, under certain circumstances, uncertainty measurement. Critical quantitative uncertainty measurement concerns will address the following concepts. The identification and evaluation of all sources of potential error, and the identification of and significance of identical uncertainties must be evaluated in the uncertainty budget. And finally, the establishing and close monitoring of results near critical values. Specifically, 5.10.3.1c reads that uncertainty measurement shall be included in a test report to the customer when it is relevant to the validity or application of the test results when a customer's instructions so requires or when the uncertainty affects compliance to a specification limit. 
While a tremendous amount of emphasis could be placed and should be placed on uncertainty in measurement, and whether or not the laboratory's version of uncertainty measurement budgeting is frequentist or Bayesian in nature, Section 5.4 provides additional useful information in the requirement that the method to be employed must indeed be validated. Although there is a common misperception among lawyers and even among laboratory managers that ISO 17025 provides a method of validation specific to the forensic science disciplines, this is not the case. Instead, the requirement of 5.4.5 is for the laboratory to have documentation that includes specifically how it is determined that a given method is to be applied and that it, its instructions as well as its procedures are in fact validated as promulgated and used. This is an include limitations on the assay to be performed. This could be very useful for the criminal law practitioner. For example, in the case of solid drug dose examination of seized drugs and its determination. It is possible that within the laboratory's own documents, there could be a damaging admission of the inability to determine and discriminate between positional isomers and other chiral compounds. During the validation process, although not specifically outlined in ISO 17025, at a minimum, the following should be addressed by any laboratory doing any testing. Matrix effects, sample homogeneity, specificity of the assay, the demonstrated range of linearity, precision, interfering substances, stability of the various targets, the population distribution, and traditional concerns of a frequentist measurement uncertainty. It is acceptable per ISO 17025 to use reliable, published, and commercially available information to establish each parameter so long as after the implementation of the validated process, it is effectively monitored while it maintains and is in place. If there is deviation from the reliable, published, and commercially available information upon which the method relies, then it is required that the laboratory recognize that the previous method was producing inappropriate results and therefore embark upon a new process of validation that will ensure that the process employed and the methodology is one that is indeed suitable for its intended purpose. Of additional practical use to us is Section 5.6 and specifically Section 5.6.2.1.1. It holds that the laboratories, when they construct a calibration curve or do other types of calibration of the instrument that can contribute to the uncertainty, must properly document the measurement traceability of these reference standards to classic measurement items, such as the International System of Units or in the case of items that cannot be strictly made to SI units, such as in the case of drugs or DNA profiles, these reference materials are to be traceable to an appropriate measurement standard. There is a distinction between reference standards and reference materials as outlined in section 5.6.2. While one cannot certify street cocaine, and hence this would be a reference material, one can certify certified reference materials, CRMs or SRMs. And those are reference standards. ASCLAD Lab and in its interpretation and granting of ISO 17025 accreditation takes Section 5.6 to an additional safeguard step in that it requires that whatever calibration service provider is used by a laboratory must also be ISO 17025 accredited. Another potential source of uncertainty that is addressed by ISO 17025 is the distinction that is made regarding the equipment itself. Section 5.5 requires the laboratory to have a method to identify and classify its instruments that are used throughout the process. There is a distinction between Class 1, Class 2, and Class 3 instruments that is important for the practitioner to be aware of so as to be able to determine whether or not the very best scientific process was employed and whether or not the best calibration of the equipment was undertaken. Per ASCLAD Lab's interpretation of ISO 17025, Class III instruments are the only type of instru instruments whose calibration service providers do not need to be ISO 17025 compliant 
per ASCLAT lab's interpretation. It is required that the laboratories to not only state that the calibration service providers are ISO 17025 accredited, but they must be able to prove through documentation the competence, the traceability, and the measuring ability of the service provider, especially if it's not an ISO 17025 accredited service provider. Perhaps the single biggest area of potential uncertainty and one of the most useful to expose remains the undeclared potential source of erroneous results. It is encapsulated and addressed in section 5.7 entitled sampling. In all analytical measurements, the analytical device very seldom weighs and or measures the entire sample as it organically exists. Therefore, only a very small part of the whole, called an aliquot or aliquant, is actually tested by any analytical device. As a result, it becomes crucial and vitally necessary for the laboratory to ensure homogeneity in the aliquot or aliquant tested. Right now, shockingly, most laboratories do not have a written policy or procedure or instructions that address this. They may be totally ignorant of this issue altogether. It is this crucial difference between sampling versus sample selection that needs to be exposed by all of us in the criminal defense field. In essence, what happens in the laboratory when an aliquot is prepared is an exercise of massive amount of truly subjective discretion by selecting a pinch of this or a section of that from a whole unknown sample submitted for examination. It is clear that by doing such, even with a policy, procedure, and instruction in place, massive representation error with respect to non-colloidal mixtures can absolutely occur. Sample selection in the case of trace evidence, for example, per ISO 17025, section 5.7, will require a written policy, a written procedure, and a written instruction that is universally enforced, implemented, and monitored by the laboratory down to the technicians at the bench as to which hairs or fibers out of the many or which part of a stain to swath an example, uh, to examine, for example. This is an example of sample selection. This is to be distinguished from sampling itself, wherein there must be a written policy, written procedure, and written instruction to make sure that there is homogeneity in a sample and that it in fact exists. A fine example of this would be blood alcohol and blood alcohol sampling. Without assurance of homogeneity in such a sample, random sampling error is introduced and inaccurate results may be reported. Per ISO 17025 and ASCLAD lab, there must be rigorous training as well as a plan and a procedure in place for sample selection as well as sampling. If one were to obtain the policy, for example, of either sampling or sample selection, then there could be and there should be some very useful language contained that admits to the very fundamental source of subjectiveness and identifies sampling and sample selection as to large potential sources of error.